Good stuff. Luke chapter 5. You know, I'm going to do something that we don't typically do. Uh, just, um, I don't think there's a right or wrong, but um, I, verse 17 of chapter 5. I want to read from there all the way to Luke chapter 6, verse 11. That's, that's a lot of scripture we're going to get ready to read. And that's why I wanted you to have a blue Bible or pull it up on your phone so you can follow along. Um, it won't be on the screen. And so and maybe you have the book of Luke memorized. And if you do, I'm just going to trust. If you're not looking down at a Bible or phone or something, I'm going to trust you have the book of Luke memorized. Kudos to you for the rest of us. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Let's read. One day as he was teaching... Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him to the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow (laughs) who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? There's the first time in this passage that I'm going to read that we see the Pharisees getting upset at Jesus. Let's keep reading. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been uh, lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we've seen remarkable things today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. We also know him as Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's the second time the Pharisees come against Jesus. They're mad at him. Conflict. What's he going to do? Verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Here's another conflict with the Pharisees. Jesus answered, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. And he told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, and if he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for he says, the old is better. One Sabbath... Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in the hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Once again, conflict with the Pharisees. Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God. This is recorded in the Old Testament, by the way. He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. And then Jesus said to him, I ask, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so. And his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Ooh, the plot thickens. Jesus, he was being Jesus, the Messiah, the the Son of God, the God himself, God incarnate. He was doing what Jesus was supposed to do. 
and the Pharisees didn't like it. Can I remind you of something? Who are the Pharisees? It's in your notes. It'll be on the screen. Here it is. The Pharisees, real quick, we can look over this. Uh, By far, they were the most influential religious group. Uh, They followed the Old Testament law. They uh, followed their own religious traditions. They highly re- were highly respected in the community. The ancient historian Josephus wrote that there were about 6,000 Pharisees at this time. Uh, here's something interesting. They started out good. In fact, have you ever known someone that started out good? They, were, they, were, they loved the Lord. They were teaching right doctrine. They were, they were uh, upholding, holding on to something. It was good. But then the longer it went out, the farther they started to stray from truth. And that's where the Pharisees were. In fact, let me just toss this out there as a reminder. The Pharisees were good. They held, they were people who were in a position to say, thus saith the Lord, here's what God's word says. Here's what the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament say. And we're going to hold on to this and we're going to follow this faithfully. Here's the problem. They started creating, so we got five books of the, the Old Testament, the first five books, okay. They started creating rules to keep these rules. <laughs> so they created this set of rules, and then they said, well, in order to keep those, let's set this set of rules, and this set of rules, and this set of rules. I read somewhere that it was somewhere around 600 other rules that at this point the Pharisees had come up with to try to make sure that they all kept the rules, if you will, the, uh, uh, the, the commands of Scripture in the first five books of the Bible. So they, they were just, they were so, fu- they started off good, but um, uh, they ended up being um, religious and full of religion. And their literal name actually means separated one. So the Pharisees were there. They were also the teachers of the law. These were the scribes. Who are they? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to answer. Here it is. They're teachers of the law. They're legal specialists of the day. The ones who duplicated copies of scripture for the Jews. Very meticulous. Many were also Pharisees. And by the time Jesus, they had become a fairly powerful class as well. So, um, th- so here's these people. They've, they've, they've got this position of authority. And then along comes Jesus. And you start to see this. Why? Why were the Pharisees so upset with Jesus. What was their problem? Well, here, here's kind of the issue. They felt threatened. They felt like Jesus was challenging their authority. They're like, we're in charge here. When it comes to the religious, we're in charge. And Jesus comes along and starts uh, um, not just uh, um, uh, um, having crowds flock to him, but he's saying things that go against what they would hold dear in their teachings of Judaism. And so the Pharisees were hacked off. They were like, "Ah, ah, what are we going to do with this guy? And they wanted to see him taken out. So today we see several several times here in just this uh, short two, two chapters where the Pharisees just were head on, just like, well, wait a minute. You can't do that on the Sabbath. Well, wait a minute. This isn't. And, and their, their conflict has is arisen. <laughs> and so, um, so here's the question. What can we learn from this passage? What can we learn from this passage of Scripture that would be applicable to us today? I would assume that most of you do not have a Jewish background. I'm just assuming. Um, and I, I would assume that um, maybe, but is there anything we can learn or grasp? And really, as I've studied this, I just, I, 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 forwards, backwards, upward, downward, in, right, out, right, happy all the time. I mean, I just, I, I some of you, you recognize that song from Kids Church. Okay, but um, some of you think I'm crazy, but here's the deal. There was one thing that I just kept coming back to as I studied this passage. I just kept coming back to it, coming back to it, coming back to it. And here it is. It's in your notes. There's really just one main idea here, and here it is. Christianity can't be mixed. Fill it in. The gospel message, Christianity, can't be mixed with anything else. So let's talk then. Um, If Jesus is trying to make this point, He's making it to this, uh, the Pharisees, they're, they're Jews of Jews. Um, well, what was it that he's trying to say to these Jewish guys? Well, what's the difference? Uh, what, what, 
what's the, what's the difference between Judaism and this new, the gospel, the, the Christian message of Jesus? Let's just pinpoint a few things at this time. Judaism was concerned with staying away from sinners, right? Staying away from sinners. And the gospel of Jesus was concerned with being with sinners, you remember the whole Matthew, Levi? Levi had this, this thing, and, and they're like, well, we can't believe that you're hanging out with these kind of folk and these kind of people. Can't believe you're doing that. And Jesus is like, wait a minute. I haven't come for the health. I've come for the sick. So there's, there's a difference there. This, the next one, Judaism was concerned with self-righteousness. Boy, look at me. Aren't I good? I do this, I do this, I do this, and I keep this rule, keep this rule, keep this rule. The gospel of Jesus was concerned with the heart righteousness. Judaism was, was very much a, an outward thing, and Jesus is all about what's in the heart, Christianity. Let's go to the next. Judaism was concerned about what men think, and the gospel of Jesus is concerned about what God thinks. Judaism of this day, of this time, was concerned only with the outside, and the gospel was concerned with the inside so there's a huge difference between these two and in this passage we just read Jesus makes it very clear that the gospel is incompatible with Judaism that what these Pharisees and scribes are seeing that looks to them to be kind of a religious behavior is but is very opposite of their religion in fact is accurate the, the behavior is different because the gospel of different is different. And this is really something we got to remember today in our culture because sometimes, follow me here, we live in a very, uh, it's all good, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, what do you think about Jesus? Well, I think he was a good man and my religion says he's a good man. And, uh, what? It's not all good. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the gospel, you can't just throw Jesus as a prophet into your religion and think it's all good and, and we're all together. You can't just um, add another book uh, to the gospel and to the gospel message and hold it to the same uh, position as the gospel and just mix, uh, say, the Book of Mormon with the Holy Scriptures and say it's all good, it's all good. No, no. There is none like our God. There is no other God other than the God of the Bible. And Jesus can't be mixed. The gospel of Jesus can't be mixed with any other religion. And that's what they're focusing on right now. This is what Jesus is trying to help them to see. The fact of the matter is the gospel can only, and if it's going to be effective, it can only replace all other religious systems. And that is very countercultural. Come on, am I right? Because what culture outside of church would say is, oh, just embrace all religions lead to God. We don't all religions end up in the same place. Well, according to Scripture, no. No. The only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. And that makes Christianity very exclusive. And I, and, 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 and I know we live in a, very, uh, in a society that's very... Uh, high value of inclusivity and and but you gotta understand when when push comes to shove and it comes down to doctrinal truth we have to embrace the truth that jesus is the only way and the gospel message will not mix so get the full picture here jesus had just dealt a severe blow to these jews um, because jesus said <clears throat> he said i'm from god in fact watch this and he healed the guy uh, who, who was lame, and, and he got up and picked up his mat and walked. How many like to see the, the Blu-ray of that one when you get to heaven? I mean, I just, I'd love to see just how they peeled back the roof and, and dropped him down. <clears throat> I'd like to see the face of the Pharisees as Jesus healed, but not just when Jesus healed him, because Jesus didn't just heal. That's something that's very God-like, right? Healing people, very God-like. The thing that was, was um, very God-like as, just as much is he forgave the guy's sins. And that got these Pharisees, that got their goat. I mean, that just got them going. It's like, who's this guy say he is? He can forgive sins and heal people, come on. And so, and so um, uh, Jesus is coming like straight up in their face. So here's God and here's what God is doing. 
God's calling a few of the most uh, um, uh, hated people, like Levi. Remember, he's a tax collector. Oh, Jesus called uh, some of the other disciples, like the fishermen and people like that. You know, we, we read about the, the call of, of Simon Peter and, and some of those. We studied that. But then he called, he called some of these people to follow him, like Levi, Matthew, a tax collector, a much hated person by everyone. And you can go back and hear the messages we talked about Matthew, Levi's call. But the Pharisees are like, why in the world would you call these type of people to follow you? And so put yourself in the shoes of the Pharisees. Can you do that just for a second? What were they wondering at this point? They were wondering, well, why doesn't he follow our traditions? And if he really is who a religious leader, if he really is, dare I say he's the Messiah, he can't be the Messiah because he doesn't fit all of our rules. He's not following our rules. I don't understand. This person is, is, he's not following any of our rules. He's not doing what we know a person should be doing. They're shocked by the way he broke the whole religious etiquette and the religious traditions. And so that's why there's now this conflict. And as as we approach scripture, we get to specifically Luke chapter 5, verse 33. Depending on how you count it, this is maybe the third or time of the Pharisees just kind of uh, confronting Jesus, coming against him. Some would debate whether in verse 33 this is really the Pharisees. I believe it was them speaking. But the fact of the matter is there were religious people coming against Jesus. And so, think about this. In the house where the paralytic was healed, there was no real direct confrontation of the Pharisees. But there is at the time of the Feast of Levi, there's direct confrontation. And now we even get more intense confrontations. Jesus speaks directly to them about the emptiness and the incompatibility of Judaism and and the gospel message, the Christianity that Jesus is living and teaching. And he's starting to lay, and when we get to verse 33, it's like Jesus is like, okay, it's time. I mean, have you ever been in a conversation with someone and kind of my, my style of leadership, my style of talking to people and whatever, is I, I kind of like to dance around a little bit and, and let's just, and we're going to end up where we need to get. Now, some of you, you're very straightforward and you're just like, Fzing! you go right to the thing. And, 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 and I kind of get this feeling like, until verse 33, Jesus in some ways was kind of dancing around. He knew what was in their hearts, so he, he said this, and he knew as he said, and he's kind of going around like this. And I'm not a boxer. I don't know if you can tell. I'm more of a b- ballet person. <clears throat> After this week, I can tell you I'm definitely not a soccer person. Wow. That's, talk about a snooze fest. Um, I'm sorry if you like soccer, but Okay. But listen, in verse 33, let me tell you what Jesus does. I mean, what, what are you talking about, Scott? Verse 33, um, uh, they said, John's disciples often fast and pray, and he, they get on this whole conversation of, of fasting, and, and Jesus kind of, he's going, but in verse 36 is really where it just, Zoom! It just like zooms right in. Uh, I like to say it this way. Jesus is taking the cookies out of the container and putting them on the bottom shelf. So I want you to get this. Here it is. Jesus came to make a complete break with Judaism and a complete break with the old. And he said in verse 36, let's look at the first. Three things he points out. First is verse 36. He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. Let's just stop right there. Let's talk about patches. Now, um, there's a simple point here. Now, I, I, I haven't used a patch in years, I'll be honest with you. I remember when I was a little boy, though, uh, what was the first thing to wear out in my clothes? It was always right here, right? My knees and my d- uh, mom would sew these iron-on patches at that time. Maybe you remember those? And she thought, if you put them on the inside, they're going to work better. Put them on the outside, they're going to work better. And they always end up coming off. But um, mom had great, great dreams of that. But um, 
that something good was going to come out of it. Back in this time, it wasn't iron-on, right? They would, uh, if they were going to patch a garment, they would sew it in there. Whatever. And so what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. Why? If you take, oh, I got this hole in these old pair of pants, let's just say, well, here's a new garment. Let's cut that up and let's put a patch from there on you. You just ruined the new pants, right? Just like, you wouldn't do that. And is it also, if you had a hole in your new pants, you got a good deal on them though, but if you had a, if you had a hole in this, um, you wouldn't take an old pair of pants and just take that and put it on here because, well, what's he say? If he does, he will have torn the new garment in the patch with the new one will not match the old. It's not gonna match. They're not gonna match. It's not gonna work. It's just not... Okay, so if you had a new garment, you wouldn't tear that up because you'd want that new garment. And if, if you took the piece out of the new and sewed it in the old, Matthew and Mark actually call this the unshrunk piece. As soon as you wash it, the new piece shrinks and it just rips the threads out and creates the hole all over again. And now you haven't been able to repair the old and you've ruined the new. It's kind of a simple illustration. So what's he saying? You can't patch the gospel into Judaism. Judaism is the old garment. You can't take a piece of the gospel and just patch it in. It can't be done. You can't mix it. You can't put the unshrunk new cloth into the old, worn, faded cloth. And if you do, Luke says, it won't match anyway. This point again is Christianity, it doesn't mix with other religions. Christianity won't mix with other religions Jesus is saying Judaism is a worn out garment. And at its core, it's useless to try to patch with, uh, uh, with a piece of, of, of the gospel. Jesus has not come with a message of patching the old system, but replacing the old system. I want, you to, I want you to get this. And, and the new internal gospel of repentance and forgiveness cannot be mixed with any tradition of self-righteousness. Boy, aren't I good of any kind. In our community, it may not be Judaism, but you better believe and know that in our community, there are many people that do things outwardly thinking, boy, how spiritual I am. Look how saved I am. Look how godly I am on the outside. And Jesus' words to them today and the Jesus' words to us is, listen, that's not where it's at. You can't do it. You can't just add Christianity into a works-based religion. It's not going to work. The gospel won't work. So listen to what I say. I, I want you to get to understand this. The old garment here is not the Old Testament. It's Judaism. We're talking about the religious system of Judaism. Pieces of the gospel can't be stitched into that system or any other system. And if you want to get real clear on this, go back and study the book of Galatians. In fact, one of the first books of the Bible that we ever preached, I, I looked this up, I think it was 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, was the book of Galatians. Right now, obviously, we're studying through the book of Luke, but it was Galatians, and that was over 10 years ago, um, and I was looking back over some of my notes for uh, another thing I was doing, and I, I, was, I was drawn, though, um, to chapter 3, verse 1. Um, you, you might uh, recognize this, but you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? A Jewish group um, had come in, and they were trying to bring some of the Jewish customs, the Jewish laws, the Jewish ways, and add them into the, the, the life of these Christians, saying, now you must be this, whatever this was, and trying to mix Judaism in with Christianity. And the Apostle Paul was saying, stop, who's tricked you? You guys have been saved. You've been redeemed. You've experienced the gospel, the faith, putting your faith in Christ and freely receiving by grace the forgiveness. Who's tricked you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, capital S, being inside of you, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort or works? Look at verse 4. Have you suffered so much for nothing? 
If it really was for nothing, does God give you his spirit, Holy Spirit, and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? And so um, here, here we are, years after our text, we're in the book of Galatians. This is some time after. And they're still struggling. There's still people that are like, all these rules, these regulations, these, they're trying to bring it into Christianity, and it doesn't work. It won't mix. So we get to verse 37, and Jesus goes past the patch illustration. He starts on a new one. Look at it, look at it. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new, excuse me, no, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Okay, so what's that all about? Let me just explain what I learned this week. And I've heard others preach on this and teach on this, but basically, they would make new wine, and they would prepare often a goat skin. Ooh. Sounds kind of gross to me, but they would, they would clean, you know, they'd go through some process with the goat skin. But basically, they'd want it to be, um, you know, uh, dare I say fresh, um, but, but they, they would tie off any area that needed to be tied off in that goat skin. And they would literally keep it in as much of one piece as possible. And I'm, I'm told that it would even, they would actually, when you'd go and, and press the grapes or however that looks, and, and, and you'd pour that, that wine into the, the neck of the goat. They'd chop the head off and the neck and they'd pour it down. And then they'd tie off the neck of the goat. I'm not a goat, but I'm just pretending like I am. If I were, and they'd tie that off. And so no, no air, nothing could get out of that. And so what would happen then is that, that wine would begin to ferment, right? And so that thing would start to blow up. And, and, and then after a while, all the dregs and all the yuck of whatever's in there went to the bottom. So they'd pour it into another brand new goat skin and pour it in there, tie it off, do the same thing. And it'd start to ferment a little further. And all the dregs and all the yuck would go to the bottom and, until they finally got the product, the wine that everybody wanted, right? Well, they would, they would only pour the new, the, that wine that they're making into new wine skins because if they poured it into a skin that had already been used, when you pour it in there and that, that wine begins to ferment, and psh, all, every, it would just pop. It would tear. It would open up, and you'd lose all of your wine. You'd lose everything you were going for. So the only, the only time, the only thing that you could use for new wine would be a new Wine skin. So that's kind of a rude explanation of something that I know very little about. Other than just studying up on this, you can maybe watch a YouTube about it later on. Um, but uh, but here's, here's what we, we need to understand. Um, particularly, the new wine had to be first put in expandable skin to allow for that expansion. So what he's saying is that if you take this new wine and put it in old, cracked uh, brittle, stiff wineskins, you're going to be in trouble. And so he's trying to make the point, you cannot put the gospel into Judaism. It just doesn't mix. You can't put it into any other religious system. You can't drop it in a sacramental, uh, excuse me, uh, a, a system that's all sacramental based. I mean, um, when you go to the Old Testament and you see that um, the way they dealt with sin and the way they dealt with their worship, whatever, was all, um, you'd, you'd have a sacrament. You'd, you'd, it was animals. Well, Jesus came to fulfill that. And so the idea that you've got to continue on with all of these rules and all these, Jesus came to fulfill that. And so it doesn't mix with the gospel. You take the gospel and you put it in any works righteousness system and you make it void. In fact, going back to Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, I thought this was good. You, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. Hmm. If, if, in fact, let me just put it another way so that we can all understand it. The Ten Commandments won't save you. I mean, just let that sink in. You could be committed to never lie, never commit adultery, uh, never covet your neighbor's donkey or cow. I mean, you could go through all the Ten Commandments, not to steal. Um, you could go through all those Ten Commandments, and if you kept all ten of them, do you know that you still wouldn't be saved? 
The law has its place. But the only way that you and I can put to know that we're saved, that we're redeemed, that we're forgiven, it isn't by keeping all the rules. It's by freely receiving the grace of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And when he rose again, it's by freely receiving that. It's, it's by grace we are saved. Through faith, we put our faith in Christ. That's the only way. And then, because we love Jesus and his love is on the inside of us, ah, now I'll tell you what. I, his love is saying, don't lie. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. I, I struggle with that one. Don't, don't, what? Whatever, whatever the Ten Commandments, I'm not, this, the Ten Commandments aren't the thing that saved me. We don't have a works-based righteousness because my righteousness is as filthy rags. But because Christ has come, I take on his righteousness. And because of that, I want to do good works. You see the difference? Do you see the difference? I know for some of you, this is just very elementary. And for some of you, God is really going to give you a revelation today that you are not saved by your works. And any religion that says it's about me doing, 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 and if I do enough, then I'm going to go make it to God, is not Christianity. And it, Christianity and that religion will not mix. It's incompatible. Grace is not compatible with any works system. The gospel of forgiveness by grace through faith alone in Christ alone can't be put into a dry and brittle skin of works righteousness systems, including Judaism. And so that's what you can't take Christianity like you can't take the, the new wine and put it in an old wine skin. It won't work. It's going to bust at the seams. And so Jesus is saying you can't take Christianity and the gospel of Jesus. You can't take that and fit it into the old wine skin of Judaism. And so then Jesus gave a third and a final illustration. And I think this is kind of sad, but it really is. I mean, it's, it, it's sad in that, okay, just to make sure you really got it. We talked about patches, talked about wineskins. Now I want to make sure you got it. What does he say? Verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. He says, let me just tell you straight up, there's some of you, you're not going to receive the new, in fact, I think it's like five times in the NIV from verse 36 to 39, five times the word new is used. And so Jesus is like, verse 39, you, you're not, <laughs> you're, you're not going to receive this. It's kind of like the guy who's got his favorite wine. He's like, I've drank this wine my whole life and I'm not about to change now. Bless God. And you can, you can say, hey, this is a, it's a new wine. It's going to be great. It's got a new whatever this is, and this is great. I'm not really into my wines, but whatever like, is really cool about wine, this has got a bouquet. It's got a bouquet, or I don't know. But it's like, here's the thing. Is this, this, this is the best and the greatest, and the, I, this, is, this is this and this. And the, mm, I don't want any of that stuff. I'll just take the old stuff. Thank you very much. And that's, that's what Jesus is saying. You guys are so set in your ways. That here is freedom. Here is life. Here is, I've come to give you life and give it to its fullest, more abundantly. This is going to be, here it is. It's new. I've come to fulfill the Old Testament. And, and we've, there's a new thing here. I want to do a new thing. And this is going to be great. And they're like, I don't want it. We're waiting for the Messiah, and as soon as he gets here, it's all going to be good. And I hope everyone else is ready, too. And Jesus is like, I am the Messiah. Hello. And he's trying to help them to grasp this. But they just won't do it. And that's exactly what verse 39 is saying. Verse 39 is saying, man, you just, here it is. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. I just like the old. And I think we need to be careful. Um... I'm not even going to go there, but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, I, I, think, I think it's, it's true. People who have been in religions for a long time, they get very comfortable. I think all of us, you, you cultivate this taste for tradition. You cultivate the taste for that experience. And let's face it. 
even ourselves, there's a tradition that we fall in here at Pathway. I mean, I wouldn't say it's ungodly by any ways, but what if, what if we would have done something like taken the offering and did it at the very beginning of service? I don't know. What if we would have like had the preaching of the word and then had the worship singing time? Some of you wouldn't have been able to handle that. You're like, what's going on? I think another, another cup of coffee, please. And we was like passing coffee around. It's like, come on, just, just settle down. Why? Because we like our traditions. We like the way. And, and so we need to be careful of it as well. But imagine uh, some people are in a whole other religious systems. And maybe some of you at one point you were. You're in a, you're in a completely a religious system that is outside of the freedom we find in Christ. And um, in, in what Jesus is trying to point out to the, to the I almost said the Philistines, but um, the Pharisees and, and those, it's like, listen, Christianity will not mix with, uh, with, with that. And, and these people were self-satisfied. They'd grown comfortable with their mixture of Christianity and whatever else. And like old men who'd been drinking a certain wine all their life, they were not at all interested in a new one, no matter what it may have promised so here's the question I have for you. What Jesus was saying is that those who have cultivated deeply the love of their traditional religion have no interest in the gospel. And let me just start right there. Is that you? I'm not asking even, uh, like, for some of you, like, well, I'm not a Muslim, or, well, I, I, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I, I'm not a Buddhist. Well, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a uh, fill-in-the-blank. And you think, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I understand that. But in what ways have you tried to fit the gospel and Christianity into your life, into your thought system, worldview, instead of saying, you know what, no, I'm taking on a new worldview that I'm gonna gonna say, here's my life and I wanna line it up with the word of God instead of here's my life and I wanna just come and bring it into my life. You see the difference? In what ways are, are, are you just like, okay, I'm going to take that and this and this and this, and, and you're still going to just kind of have your own kind of way of doing Christianity when God says, no, that won't mix and that won't work. What we've got to do is come underneath the leadership and the lordship of Jesus Christ and the word of God, and um, that's the goal of Christianity, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole, and, and, and so think about it. Have we found this to be true in modern day that there's some religion Religious people that are just like, I, I'm not, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I mean, I'm not going uh, to change. It's just, I'm just, this is just the religion that I'm in and the place where I'm at. And, and here, here's the sad thing is there, there are people that are, are fine people that your neighbors, my neighbors, all of our neighbors, we love them. But they, they, dare I say, they've got this God in, in country type Christianity. And listen, I love our country, don't get me wrong, but um, uh, just because you're born in the United States and um, we, our founding did have a Christian base and, and um, just because of that doesn't mean that you're automatically a follower of Christ, correct? But there are many people still in our nation that would, would still fall into that. They say, well, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Islam, well, what are you? Well, I'm Christian, but have you really come into contact with, with the message of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? Have you really received Christ? Have you really found freedom in Jesus? 18 years ago, this is who, uh, who just bird, started burning my heart. 18 years ago, when we started Pathway, I knew so clearly, and I can say to you clearly today, this is still the, the thing that keeps me up at night. I, I talk to friends. In fact, this October, we have some new friends that are going to come and talk to you. They're going to... Uh, uh, to Oman and, and countries that are just so deeply uh, ingrained with the Muslim faith. And they're going in there and, and, and they're just chomping at the bit. Get me there. I want to go there. I want to start churches there. And, they're, and I'm kind of like, okay, we'll get you there. But God, thank you for not sending me. 
I, I, I have a hard time putting myself in the shoes of my American friend who, who just has such a, God has given them such a heart for Oman, such a heart for Chile, such a heart. I love Haiti. Don't get me wrong. I've been to Haiti five or six times in the past eight years. I enjoy the time. I've, I've met some wonderful Haitian people. I love Mission of Hope. I'm so glad that we have a partner like Mission of Hope that is, is, is ministering there on that island. I'm excited. I can cast fish. I can get excited about that. But can I tell you, every time I've gone and when I've come home, I've almost kissed the ground. I am so glad to be home. On Tuesday, Megan and I will fly out for the first time to the continent of Africa. We're going to the country of Tanzania. And we're going to be in some bush country. We're going to, for about 10 days, we're going to be, we're going to be traveling. And, and we're going to be there with our friend Tim Enlow. Some of you know who that is. And World Serve is a missions organization we're going to be with. And what they're doing all over Tanzania, uh, Tanzania, they're planting churches. And the way they're doing that is they're digging a well and planting a church. Digging a well and planting a church. I honestly, uh, I have no idea what to expect other than what, what Tim's told me. I've joked around with you before about how there are people that know the click language, you know. I mean, they, they kind of, they have that kind of a language. I understand that there's a good chance we'll run into some people while we're on this trip that actually talk like that. I'm hoping just to get my camera out and just kind of like mm, get a little bit of that for you. I, I, I don't know what it's going to be like. I know this, off the coast of Tanzania, there's an island called Mafia Island. Just the name of the island makes me not want to go there. I'm just, but I, but we're going we're gonna to meet some missionaries and some local pastors on that island that have been beaten for their faith. And we'll have scars to show it. And I'm hoping to get some interviews with these people and talk to them and just see how God is moving in this area. And this is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm saying, I'll, if, it, if it's about people making it to heaven with me, I'm all over that. In fact, I'll come back and I'll plead with this church to give like you've never given before to foreign and home missions. I'll, I'm, I'm all over that. But I can tell you this. I'm, I'm pretty sure up to this point, God has not called me to Mafia Island and the moment I go from whatever, uh, Dar el Salaam, or I don't even know what the name of the airport we're flying out of, and we're going to land in Amsterdam, be there for a couple hours. In about uh, 12 days, we'll be on our way home in and, and a couple hours, and then we'll, we'll land in Chicago. I can tell you, on July the 6th, when I land back in the United States in Chicago, Illinois, even Chicago, I will praise Jesus <laughs> because I love our country. In fact, I love our community. I love this area. And this is what I'm getting at. My heart, what keeps me up at night are people that look just like you and me, but they're simply religious. They understand some things about God, but they don't really know Jesus through his son. They don't know God through Jesus' son. They're simply religious. And that's really the heartbeat of this church is we want to see people that know about God. They're simply religious, but they've never really committed to follow Christ. They've never really come to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's where it's It's not enough just to know about God. The thing that keeps me up at night, the thing that hits me to my core is people who are very pharisaical in their life when it comes to Christianity. They're simply religious, and our country is full of them. And I feel called to this nation. I feel called to this country to minister to the people like that, just like many of our missionary friends feel called to go wherever it is that they're called to. And I want you to feel that as well. And I believe Jesus wants you to feel that. There's no mixing of Christianity, though. And for those who aren't willing to come out of their false religions into the gospel, there's just no hope. So what do we do? Do we tell them that it's okay and put the gospel in as a patch? Or do we tell them that it's okay and dump some of the gospel in their old wineskin? Or do we have to preach that the gospel stands alone? You know the answer to that. We've got to be clear. Jesus is the way and the only way. 
Would you stand with me?